a powerful weather system on the Great Plains this Friday afternoon. You would not know it looking at the satellite imagery because we're lacking that classic comma cloud pattern, but the storm system is there. Social media buzzing with some spectacular photos, such as this one from Talbert Preston out there in eastern Colorado. And this is what they had out earlier near Fort Collins from Michael Charnick. And that last photo that you saw was in this convective cloud mass around Cheyenne and Fort Collins. And then as the morning goes on, we have the front surging south through northeastern Colorado. You can see the linear convective clouds right there and dust. And that's it coming south. And right now that dust field is about to Goodland, Kit Carson, Eads, and the Palmer Divide. And it should be mentioned that there is dust not only behind the front, but out in the warm sector. Some of it right here, those strong westerly winds moving over the crop fields, and you can see some gravity waves in that stuff. Very spectacular. Here's a look at the current wind field. Fortunately, most of the gusts are under 50 knots. The main exception, Burlington. And let's see what that gust figure is. 55 knots. And that's about the strongest I have on the map. And visibility, 2.5 miles. Being reported erroneously as haze, that is definitely going to be dust. And quite a bit of that out ahead of the cold front, which is about like this. Everybody getting an extra helping of that dust, but fortunately it should taper off this afternoon and be mostly gone by this evening. Here's a look at the surface map for this afternoon showing that strong polar front coming into northeastern Colorado. That's creating the main dust surge and it has already pushed a little bit further ahead than what we've got depicted here. The main thickness ribbon, that's pretty easy to spot. That's going to be about like that, and that's going to be associated with jet stream energy coming from the southwestern part of the U.S. into the Great Lakes. Further south, a surge of moisture heading north, and I actually put the warm front pretty far north because that's where I'm seeing the main transition. We go from 40s up in the Great Lakes area to upper 50s and lower 60s down to the south, and not much change further down towards South Texas. But there is a little bit of cold air damming in the Arklatex area. You can see that 48 degree reading, easterly winds, and that's a little pocket of cold air right there. And you can see that on one side, 59 over 59, and to the north, 55 over 47. That's not a whole lot different, a little bit drier to the north. But that kind of shows you that this air mass here is a little bit different from this one in the Arklatex area. Anyway, more warm air heading north. Why aren't we getting a severe weather risk? We've got a, a dry line from Wichita down to Wichita Falls and Del Rio. We've got moisture flowing north, 60s dew points. So what is the problem? And just to show you what I mean, there's the SPC day one outlook. Not much of anything. So we go to the high resolution rapid refresh and yeah, that does show that cold air damming right there south of the Boston Mountains and the Washita Mountains. Let's grab a forecast sounding and just take a look what's going on. And we see that there is a lot of warm air in the mid-levels. So the air mass is pretty well capped. We would have to get up into the 80s to be able to break that cap. So we raise that up with a dew point in the mid 60s and that barely breaks the cap. And with those temperatures at 700 millibars, close to 10 degrees Celsius in the middle of December, well, the start of December, that's going to definitely suppress thunderstorms. And even above that, the lapse rates are not terribly impressive. Elsewhere around the country, it was a cold morning in the eastern U.S. You can see that outgoing polar high, 1032 millibars on that. Temperatures were down in the 20s through much of the Washington and Baltimore area, 24 at Andrews Air Force Base, 23 at Washington Dulles. But they are getting a rapid warm-up as that southerly flow sets in. 
and then moving out to the western U.S. Pacific High moving in. That does have some characteristics of a plateau high. And offshore, another weather system lurking off of Seattle and Portland. Let's go up to the north. Ah, yeah, it's cold in Canada. Temperatures well below zero. And that zero line extending all the way into North Dakota and out towards Great Falls. Heading up north into Alaska, a rapid warm-up continues. That warm front that we saw the other day is pushed well out to the Beaufort Sea and 30s with some rain being reported and a bit of freezing rain out around Kotzebue. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but that's going to be that town right there. And the high Arctic of Canada is still looking pretty cold, minus 42 up at Eureka. So this is about how it looked back on Wednesday, maybe a little bit colder. 35 at Copper Mine. Yeah, these are minus 30s. That's definitely colder than what we've seen so far this season. Now this cold air is not really coming south. Let's take a look at the large-scale flow indexes and see how those look. Well, the NAO, the North Atlantic Oscillation, is well into the negative, and it will be so for the next week or so. When it's negative, that means the flow is weaker, and we tend to get blocking out near Greenland and Iceland. That's conducive to cold air coming into the North American region, and we can also take a look at the Arctic Oscillation. And that's it right there, the Arctic Oscillation, or the Northern Annular Mode. That's a measure of how the mass is distributed between the poles and the temperate latitudes. And what we've got here is a strongly negative pattern that's going to be associated with the polar vortex and the cold air blobs up north, expanding down into the temperate latitudes. So northerly flow. But this is where we're having problems. The Pacific North American Index, that's strongly negative. And we really need to see this positive, because if it's positive, then we've got ridging up in western Canada, and that pushes the cold air on south. With a negative PNA, that's conducive to pushing the air back up north. So it is a bit of a battle, and most likely not much of that polar air is going to come south. I have had some questions about those indexes in the past, so I'm going to go ahead and explain that and. While we're doing that, we'll look at the current 300 millibar chart. So this is going to be for late afternoon. As you're sitting there with an afternoon snack or your evening dinner, this is what the upper air looks like. So that NAO that we talked about, the North Atlantic Oscillation, let's go up into that area. And that brings us into Europe, and everything's kind of turned around, obviously. But there's Greenland right here. There's Iceland. And we also have the Azores located right here and Portugal. And all that does is it measures the difference in pressure between Iceland and the Azores. Other measures use Iceland and Portugal. And there's other measures that kind of consider Iceland and Greenland together. And they measure that against this area down here. So that's kind of basically a gate that measures the gradient flowing westward. So when that NAO is very high in the positive range, we have strong westerly motion, strong jets, and a tight gradient. But what we have this afternoon is negative. So that means this gradient is weaker. The wind flow is less, and it can even be reversed. And obviously, I don't see a jet through there, do you? No, nope, no jet. That whole area here is blocked. That's going to be a, well, yeah, that's going to be a Rex block. Got that cutoff low beneath this ridge. And the jet mostly heading up into Greenland. And we are developing a blocking pattern in Greenland as we go through the week. That brings us to our other index, the Arctic Oscillation, also known as the Northern Annular Mode. And that compares the sea level pressure in the Arctic Basin to the sea level pressure in the oceans, in the temperate latitudes. So south of the Aleutians and in the North Atlantic region. So that also is a gate that measures the gradient. Now, when the AO is positive, we have low pressure 
in the Arctic regions and high pressure down south. So that's going to favor strong westerly motion and a tendency for the air to flow into the polar regions. So what we have right now is negative AO, which is a reversal where we have high pressure in the polar regions and low pressure, relatively low pressure out in the oceans down south. And that favors northerly flow. So that mass of cold air up in the polar regions is moving south. And because we've got a large mass of cold air in the polar regions, that favors a strengthening of the polar vortex. So that's what we have right now. But then we go to the other ingredient, the PNA, the Pacific North American Oscillation. That looks at four major points, one near Hawaii, another in Western Canada, another in the Aleutians, and another in Florida. So when the PNA is positive, we're looking for high pressure and ridging in the mid-levels over Western Canada, and as well down there in Hawaii. And also low pressure in the Aleutians and low pressure in Florida. So as you can imagine, that gives us a upper level flow kind of like this. And you can see that the net effect is to push cold air southward, northerly flow coming out of Canada. So that's what we get in a positive PNA pattern. But today we have a negative PNA pattern. And what that indicates is low heights in Western Canada, low heights in Hawaii, high heights in the Aleutians, and high heights in Florida. So yeah, we are seeing that to a certain extent. There's some ridging right there. There's some ridging across Alaska. And we can kind of see that area of depressed heights in the western part of North America and the eastern Pacific. And that's less conducive to bringing cold air southward. Now we do have northerly flow across the Northwest Territories, but you can see it rapidly shifts around to the west in central Canada. So that's not really going to push the cold air south. In fact, deep westerly flow through much of the U.S. So it's only when we get that positive PNA pattern that we can really bring that cold air southward. Anyway, why don't we go ahead and take a look at these charts and see what's coming up for this weekend and for next week. Going forward, you can see that polar vortex start to close off from the Arctic Basin, and that really takes hold going into next week. Look at that. It closes off, centers itself over Hudson Bay. We're at Monday, Monday, December 5th. And going forward, it just kind of spins around. One little trough goes through Minnesota and into Lake Superior, associated with a cold air outbreak. But the flow across the U.S. is mostly out of the west. So that is going to prevent a lot of that cold air coming down. And looking out in the Pacific, there's another jet stream about to make landfall about a week from now. And as we go through the rest of the sequence into the end of next week, the patterns remain pretty much the same, troughing moving onto the west coast, zonal flow through the U.S. itself, and the Hudson Bay vortex, the polar vortex up there, gradually breaks down. Let's take a quick look at that forecast. Well, that cold air definitely in place up there in Nunavut Northwest Territories. The frontal system moving into the central plains about like that, and let's Bring that forward into the weekend. The cold air will continue pushing through much of the eastern U.S., settling in across the southeastern states and bringing that boundary all the way down towards the Gulf Coast. Another Alberta clipper gets going. That's it coming together up in Alberta for Sunday. And you're going to see that dive south going into Monday and Tuesday. So that's going to be, going to be another surge of cold air heading south driven by this 1024 millibar high, and another high lined up further to the northwest, and yet another one up in the Arctic. So there's going to be a succession of weak highs coming south, but really not transporting very much volume of Arctic air southward. In fact, we get this tail end wave. That's going to be about Thursday. That picks up the tail end of that boundary. Warm front in Kansas and cold front out into New Mexico. 
and that's going to move eastward and bring some inclement weather to the Midwest and eventually into the northeastern states. And back behind it, a 1045 millibar high moves in, so that's going to be quite cold for the Great Lakes, but once again, not very much cold air heading further south. And I don't think any, I see any more big changes after that, but we are at the 220 hour point, and that's getting way out there in the future. And very likely, as we get closer to the 11th and 12th, we could see a different picture across the U.S. Just a very quick look at those temperature extremes. I don't think this is going to be all that interesting, but the East Coast this morning was quite cold, 23 degrees at Wallops Island, not 22 and in the western U.S. also started out pretty cold, mid-20s at Seattle. For tomorrow, no temperature records. And there is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And since that wasn't very entertaining, there's a puppy video. Just as a reminder, you don't see this stuff on my channel because I have the ads turned off. This channel is not monetized. If you want to keep it that way, please support my channel on Patreon. Here's the link where you can do that. I appreciate your support for helping to keep this project going, and many, many thanks to those of you who have contributed. Anyway, that's all I got for this evening. Here's some more great footage from Greg out there in San Antonio just a couple days ago. Hope you all have a great Friday night and a great weekend, and we'll see you back here on Monday for the supporters and on Wednesday for everybody else. Take care. Bye-bye.